Okay. Hello, everyone. I hope you're doing well. Um, I picked out some of the more confusing uh, kinesi uh, questions from the kinesiology portion of uh, the review. Uh, there are 13 questions in all, and the confusing ones that I picked out uh, in total are about seven or eight. So let's start going over them. Uh, most of them have to do on the kinesiology portion. The reason I found most of these confusing is because you have to get really down into fine detail about origins and insertions and stuff like that. So, um, it, and, and also about functions, like which muscle does what. So I thought I would uh, make it easier on myself and you and just do a video presentation about this. Uh, so this is uh, what you should review, what you should learn before you attempt to take uh, the quiz which is on the slides and usually I would not show the slides just like this in the, the study this first portion but it's just easier for me so I'm gonna have to do it that way so the first one which muscle inserts at the spine of the scapula the acromion process of the scapula and the lateral one-third of the clavicle spine of the scapula acromion process of the scapula lateral one-third of the clavicle. The answer is the trapezius muscle. Other choices are the sternocleidomastoid muscle, which we know is not correct because of its name. It attaches at the sternum. It attaches at the mastoid process. Uh, sternoclido. I forget what clido stands for. Uh, let's, let's see. Mastoid process, sternum, and clavicle. Uh, pectoralis minor, which attaches to ribs like three, four, and five, and then attaches to part of the scapula, or all of the above. So it cannot be all of the above, because the pectoralis major, pectoralis minor, does not attach to the spine of the scapula, which is on the back of the scapula. Okay, let's let's take a look at the anatomy for that. Uh, okay, I'm sorry. Uh, so if we look at the trapezius muscle from the front, we see that it does attach to the clavicle. Uh, I want to clarify something, that it also attaches to part of the coracoid process. And um, even though the question says lateral one-third of the clavicle, that's not entirely accurate, but of the choices, it is the most accurate. If you look at the clavicle, the clavicle has attachments for the trapezius muscle and for the deltoid muscle. The deltoid is not among the choices given here. It's trapezius, sternocleidomastoid, pectoralis minor, or all of the above. So trapezius would definitely be uh, almost a dead giveaway for that as the only one of those that attaches to um, the clavicle uh, of the choices. And then if we look at the posterior aspect of the scapula, we see that the trapezius Here's this, the clavicle, and here is the spine, the spine of the scapula. You see the trapezius has attachments along the spine of the scapula and the clavicle from behind. Uh, and then there's one more section, and that is the acromion process of the scapula and the lateral third of the clavicle. And the acromion is right here. You can see that it attaches to the acromion, right? Um, the acromion, the lateral portion of the clavicle, even though it's more like the lateral two-thirds rather than the lateral one-third, and then the spine of the scapula. And let me see if I can find the... I'm sorry, I had this stuff in order and I got it, I managed to get it wonderfully out of order. Um, hooray me. Uh, if we look at a larger view of the trapezius muscle, here we go. Here's the spine of the scapula. Here's the spine of the scapula. You can see the fibers of the trap attaching to the spine of the scapula. This is from behind. Right, you can also imagine that those fibers are wrapping onto the acromion and onto the clavicle. And I want you also to see that, that the trapezius muscle has attachments to the vertebrae in the cervical spine and in the thoracic spine. It also overlaps a bunch of these muscles, which we're gonna we're gonna take a look at. Okay, next one. 
yeah, sorry, acromion. Spine of the scapula, acromion process, lateral one-third of the scapula. What three muscle groups are located in between the SCM and the anterior flap of the trapezius? SCM, anterior flap of the trapezius. So between, uh, I'm really sorry, I had, I had these in order and I must have just messed it up. So between the, just bear with me here for a second. I'm looking for the diagram of the neck. Upper limb, upper limb, head and neck. That's probably it, there we go. Okay, so between the upper trap, here's the upper trap, right? And the SCM, let me just go back to the question and make sure I'm reading it. What three muscle groups, three muscle groups are located in between the SCM and the anterior flap of the trapezius? SCM, anterior flap of the trapezius, three muscle groups. Okay, let's see. Here's a group right here, the scalenes, posterior, middle, and anterior. Posterior, middle, and anterior. And then there's also the levator scapula muscle right there, and then the splenius muscle. There may be another splenius underneath that one. Uh, and then I also wanted you guys to see, also wanted you guys to see the scalenes from the front, because it's not something that, that is visualized very often like this. I uh, just wanted you to, to see that the scalenes come down and they attach to like the second rib, the first rib, the clavicle which is removed and they come up and they, they attach to um, they attach to the, the side of the neck, to the cervical spine. So that's scalenes, the spleen eye, and the levator scapula muscle. Yeah, scalenes splenius capitis, or spleen eye, and then the levator scapula muscles. Yeah. Good, okay, moving on. Um, which muscle stabilizes the ribs when the scapula, oh wait, let's go back and look at the other choices. Okay, levator scapula is, is logical, right? Suprahyoid and infrahyoid. Um, I'm not gonna go through all of those, but um, let's just see if we can find the, the hyoid muscles. Um, no, I'm not seeing them here. Uh, No, I don't see them there. Suprahyoid and infrahyoid muscle. No, I don't I don't see them. And from this view that we started with, Mm, I see a lot of hyoid muscles, but not the supra and infrahyoid. I see the mylohyoid. Uh, here's the hyoid bone. Thyrohyoid, omohyoid, sternohyoid, uh, sternothyroid muscle, inferior phalangeal constrictor muscle. No, I don't see it. Okay, so there's, so there's that one gone. Spleen eye, by the way, that'd be splenius cervicis and splenius capitis. That's correct. Levator scapula, suprahyoid. No, I wouldn't say suprahyoid because even though I'm not seeing suprahyoid, I, I wouldn't choose that one. Uh, quite frankly, because I wouldn't know the suprahyoid muscle, but I know that the scalenes, splenius, cervicus capitis, and the levator scapula are between those two borders of the SCM and the upper trap. And then the infrahyoids, the scalenes, and the levator scapula. Well, 
the hyoids are located in front of the SCM, and that's another clue. The hyoids are in front of the SCM, and the muscles they're asking about are in back of the SCM. Uh, I know that took me a while to, to um, clarify that, to find that. I'm sorry. Thank you for sticking with me on that. Okay, which muscle stabilizes the rib when the sca the ribs when the scapula is fixed in one position? So when the scapula is like pinned down, when it's not moving, the muscles are tight so that the scapula is not moving. Uh, which muscle stabilizes the ribs? Well, the choices are pectoralis major, trapezius, serratus anterior superior, and pectoralis minor. I immediately chose serratus anterior superior because it's the one that I knew has a lot of attachments to the ribs. Turns out that's incorrect. It's the pectoralis minor. So this is a little tricky and um, let's go over it. So the correct answer is pectoralis minor. Now the pectoralis minor muscle attaches to the coracoid process of the scapula. So it is part of the scapula and it therefore controls some of the movement of the scapula. And I think some of the fibers attach to other aspects of the scapula, like the, the anterior aspect of the scapula, but it's, it'd be the lower fibers and it's not pictured. And then they extend down onto the costocartilage junction of ribs numbers three, four, and five. So it goes from ribs three through five up to the coracoid process. Now, what that means is that uh, the the pectoralis minor, its main function is to move the shoulder down, down and forward. So its main, its main function is to draw the scapula out to the side and then forward like rounded shoulder posture and then down. In that position, that's, that's very similar, that's almost exactly a shoulder blade protraction, right? Remember shoulder blade retraction is shoulder blades together, shoulder blade protraction is shoulder blades all the way apart. If you add a little depression to that, shoulder blades apart and shoulder blades down, you get the full, the full contraction of the pectoralis minor. Now it turns out that when that when the the pec minor is, is, is contracted like that, is pulling the scapula into protraction and depression, pulling it out and down like super rounded computer at your desk posture, it turns out that uh, they become very active during forced inhalation. So let's see if I can find that. Um, it says when the scapula, just a minute, uh, yeah, when the scapula is fixed in elevation by the upper trapezius and, oh, I'm sorry, I misspoke, it's not, it's not downward, okay, uh, so, so first of all, the, the, the pec minor, let me back up, the pec minor contracts when the scapula is, uh, is brought into protraction and depression. So that's like walking with a, with a pair of crutches, Right? Imagine pushing your hands down onto a pair of crutches and lifting your body weight up out of your feet a little bit and pushing into the crutches. Right? Really using your shoulder strength and pressing down toward the ground. You, then you have the activation of the pectoralis minor. Now if you take the shoulder blades the opposite way, take them up towards your ears. If you take them up towards your ears, then what happens when the scapula is in a fixed elevation by the upper trapezius and levator scapula. The pectoralis minor becomes active during strong inhalation that involves the upper chest. So if you raise your shoulder blades up towards your ears and you touch the pec minor muscle right under your clavicle and you take a deep breath in, at the end of that deep breath, you can feel your pectoralis minor muscle starting to contract. So what that means is that when the scapula is elevated, your shoulders are shrugging upward. In that position, the pectoralis minor starts to pull on the ribs at the end of the inhale. Uh, and the reason it cannot be the serratus anterior superior is because this is the serratus. 
is because the serratus, it doesn't move the shoulder blade. Uh, I'm sorry, it doesn't move the ribs as much as it moves the shoulder blade. Part of that is because of where it attaches. So the, the serratus anterior, let me get this right, serratus anterior superior attaches at the medial aspect of the shoulder blade and goes to the ribs, whereas the pec minor attaches at the costal margins of ribs three through five and goes up to the coracoid, coracoid process right here. So you can see how that would pull that shoulder blade out and down uh, and also can pull the ribs upward can pull the ribs upward and diagonally, as in inhaling high up into the chest. The serratus, on the other hand, acts more to pull the scapula than to pull the ribs. Uh, and here's the reason why it can't be the pectoralis major, because the pectoralis major does not attach to the shoulder blade. It doesn't attach to uh, the coracoid process. Uh, hold on a second, let me make sure I'm getting these anatomical features correctly. Uh, there are so many of these things that I... Uh, coracoid process. Yep, coracoid process. Okay, uh, continuing. So the, the um, pectoralis major muscle does not attach to the coracoid process. It attaches to the humerus, and it attaches to part of the clavicle, and then it attaches to the sternum and to the ribs. Some fascial aspect probably attaches to ribs one through five, but in that section, most of it attaches to the manubrium and the sternum. Uh, and then the lower portion of the pectoralis minor attaches to parts of the, parts of the ribs, like five, uh, six, seven, and eight, and some of it actually attaches to the external obliques and sometimes the rectus abdominis. Anyway, there's no attachment to the shoulder blade, the coracoid process. And here's a beautiful illustration where they, they, cut away, uh, they cut away the pectoralis major and they reflect it laterally. And you can see the attachment here um, at the humerus uh, rather than at the coracoid process. So the pectoralis major which muscle, I'm sorry, which muscle stabilizes the ribs when the scapula is fixed in one position? The pec major does not attach to the scapula. It attaches to the humerus. The trapezius uh, attaches to the scapula, but it doesn't attach to the ribs. The serratus anterior superior attaches to the medial portion of the scapula and to the ribs, but it pulls the scapula towards the ribs. It doesn't act on the ribs, which, are, which would need to move during in order to be stabilized. The pectoralis minor, only the pec minor, attaches to the ribs and to the scapula, and both moves the scapula and moves the ribs. It moves the ribs best when the scapula is fixed upward by the upper trapezius, and you take a deep breath into the upper chest. I hope that's helpful. Uh, which muscle inserts at the transverse processes of the lumbar, lumbar vertebra and the twelfth rib? I want you to, to notice, read the question carefully. It's which muscle inserts at the transverse processes of the lumbar vertebrae? That's all the lumbar vertebrae, all five, and the 12th rib. So that's just the 12th rib, not the 12th vertebrae, not the transverse process of the 12th vertebrae. Choices are serratus anterior posterior, quadratus lumborum, internal oblique, external oblique. Uh, and the answer is the quadratus lumborum. And it will be enough for us just to take a look at the diagram of the quadratus lumborum. Now the, the QL has fibers that go in different directions, but here they're drawn primarily going, uh, let's say mostly in one direction. You could make the argument that, that there are two different sets of fibers, one going to the 12th rib and one going to another set going to the uh, the lumbar vertebrae, but if you see there's the transverse processes of the lumbar vertebrae, there's L4 and L5, right? 
and then here's the 12th rib and you can see the QL attaching to the 12th rib as well as the transverse processes not the spinous process but the transverse processes of L1, 2, 3, 4, and 5. Which muscle originates at the spinous process of the second through the fifth thoracic vertebra? Semispinalis cervicis, rhomboid major, longissimus cervicis, spinalis cervicis. Again, it'll be enough just to look at the rhomboids. So this bump here is the spinous process of C7. So let's get oriented. So there's T1, T2, T3, T4, T5. Here's the rhomboid minor, and here's the rhomboid major, rhomboid major muscle. T2, 3, 4, and 5. Spinous processes of the second through the fifth thoracic vertebra. What muscle is at the inferior angle on the lateral side of the scapula? Okay, another tricky one. Rhomboid major, inferior angle on the lateral side. Teres major, subclavius, serratus anterior. Okay, again, I initially chose serratus anterior. The correct answer is teres major. Uh, it cannot be the rhomboid or the, or the serratus or the subclavius. Let's take a look at why. Inferior angle, lateral side of the scapula. Inferior angle, lateral side of the scapula. Okay, here we go. This is the, this is the back of the body. So this is the back of the scapula and the back of the humerus. Here's the inferior angle. Here's the inferior angle. And here's the lateral edge and the medial edge inferior angle, lateral aspect. Inferior and lateral, there's where the teres minor attaches. Cannot be the rhomboid because it's not on the lateral side. The rhomboid attaches at the medial side. It's also not quite down at the, at the uh, inferior angle. The reason that it cannot be the serratus anterior is because if we look at the shoulder blade and arm from the front, so we're looking through the chest wall to the front of the shoulder blade, here's the front of the shoulder, front of the arm bone, the serratus anterior, it does attach to the inferior angle, but it goes up the medial side, not the lateral side, and it goes all the way up to the superior angle. Rhomboid, subclavius, serratus anterior. And then the subclavius muscle uh, it, it cannot be the subclavius muscle because subclavius muscle attaches on the clavicle and it attaches down at the humerus. Oh no, where's the subclavius muscle down here? Um, I don't know where the subclavius attaches. I think it attaches at does it attach at the sternum? Okay, it's, it's, it's fun to think about these things because I tell you what, they are so confusing. Oh, here we go, subclavius muscle. Look, here's the clavicle. Subclavius comes down and attaches to the first rib. Look at that. Subclavius muscle, subclavius muscle. All right, I'm sorry I don't know all this stuff cold, but the fact of the matter is that uh, when it comes to the finer aspects of these muscles, like I, I don't, I don't, uh, know these cold like that. I, but I know where the trigger points and the motor points are. I know where the stuff is that I use clinically. Uh, so some of this is a, a depth of knowledge that you're probably not going to need while you're practicing uh, on clients, but you do need it for the exam. Okay, which muscle inserts at the middle facet of the greater tubercle of the humerus? All right, this requires a deep dive. The answer is the infraspinatus. The other choices are the biceps brachii, the latissimus dorsi, and the teres minor. So let's take the take a let's first look at the middle facet and the greater tubercle and the lesser tubercle of the humerus. So okay, this is the shoulder from the posterior aspect. Here's the infraspinatus muscle. 
and it comes over to the lateral and posterior aspect, the back of the humerus, and it attaches on the back of the humerus. And here's the greater tubercle, that's the bump, greater tubercle of the humerus. Here's the infraspinatus tendon. And down here is the, is the teres minor. And here's the greater tubercle, it's not labeled. Here's the greater tubercle. Notice here's the supraspinatus tendon. That'll become important a little bit later. later. Okay. Imagine that you're standing at the side of the patient. You're looking directly at their side, at their shoulder. If you take a, a small step toward the front, around to the front, so you're now looking at part of the front chest, the pectoralis area, it'd be right here, and you're seeing the front and side aspect of the shoulder. That's what you're looking at here. <coughs> Excuse me. This large bump here is the greater tubercle, and the smaller bump here is the lesser tubercle. Yeah, right here. This is the lesser tubercle. The subscapularis is not on the lesser tubercle. And then there is a, 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 a no, the subscapularis is on the lesser tubercle. And then there's a, a valley between them. And that's the intertubercular notch. And that's where the biceps tendon, one of the biceps tendons goes. Greater tubercle, lesser tubercle with the subscap attachment, intertubercular notch with the biceps tendon. Now imagine you step around a little bit to the back so you can no longer see the person's pec, but you can see the person's shoulder blade and the side of the shoulder. So the side of the, sho the shoulder blade would be here. Shoulder blade would be here. Here's the armpit. Here's the space between the armpit. Shoulder blade. And here's the back and side of the shoulder. You cannot see the front of the person's chest now. And now that's what you're seeing with view B. So this is the greater tubercle. You can't see the lesser tubercle because that's too far around in the front. And at the top is the supraspinatus, followed by the infraspinatus, followed by the teres minor. Now, if you step back around to the side, so you're looking perfectly at the side view of the person's, person's uh, shoulder. So we have the front, side front, the back, side back, and then you have right on the side. You can see the greater tubercle right here, and then you can see this lesser tubercle Okay, it's also called the greater tuberosity and the lesser tuberosity. And in between is the intertubercular notch, also called the bicipital groove where the bicep sits. That's a landmark. And then you have these little divots. Now these divots, these divots are where the tendons insert and attach. They're called facets. And they go, again, they go in order. Here's the supraspinatus or SS the infraspinatus, or IS, and the teres minor. And yeah, greater tu tubercle tuberosity, lesser tubercle tuberosity, intertubercular notch bicipital groove. Supraspinatus, infraspinatus, teres minor. Subscap would be up here on the lesser tuberosity, I believe. Let's take another look at the drawing. So here we're looking at it from the side and a little bit from the front. Right, so it's the side and the front, this view right here. So here's the greater tubercle and the lesser tubercle or lesser tuberosity and the intertubercular notch, biceps, bicipital groove. If we look at it from above, so you're standing above the patient. Imagine the patient is seated in a regular desk chair or, or dinner table chair, and you're standing above the patient, looking down at the trapezius and the top of the shoulder, the shoulder blade, scapula, and clavicle. Uh, here's the scapula or shoulder blade, right? And 
This large bump on the outside is the greater tuberosity. Here's the biceps tendon, bicipital, bicipital groove, and then on the front is the lesser tuberosity. Here's the infraspinatus muscle here. The supraspinatus muscle would be above that. They, they cut this ball like this, right? They cut it like that. They cut it across this way. So the supraspinatus would be up here. The infraspinatus would be behind it a little bit. Here's the bicipital groove. Inter, oh, here's the bicipital groove, the intertubercular notch. Bicipital groove, biceps, biceps tendon. And then in the front is the lesser tuberosity and the subscapularis tendon, which is right here, would be inserting in the, uh, looks like part of the lesser tuberosity and maybe part of the greater tuberosity. Let's see if we can, yeah, okay, so, so then these facet joints, right, this is just a different drawing of this one. So here's the superior facet, uh, the middle facet, and the inferior facet. It's here it's called the facet for the supraspinatus muscle and the facet for the infraspinatus and the facet for the teres minor. So this is just a different labeling. So SS is supraspinatus. You can see there's some overlap with this supraspinatus facet carrying the supraspinatus fibers and part, uh, and part of the middle facet carrying the supraspinatus fibers. And then the infraspinatus fibers on the middle facet and with the inferior facet, that would be the teres minor. Here's the biceps tendon. So the bicipital tendon would be like this, right? And then here's the lesser tuberosity, lesser tubercle. And this, this whole thing here would be the greater tubercle, greater tuberosity. Hopefully that, that helps you to visualize this a little bit more. Uh, let's go over it just one more time. Greater tubercle infraspinatus muscles, uh, supraspinatus muscle, infraspinatus muscle, at, and then the teres minor. And to look at it from another view, it's supraspinatus on the superior facet of the greater tuberosity, infraspinatus on the middle facet of the greater tuberosity, teres minor on the inferior facet of the greater tuberosity. Superspinatus, infraspinatus, teres minor. Uh, superior facet, middle facet, inferior facet. So that takes care of the facet portion, the middle facet of the greater tubercle of the humerus. Whew, so confusing. It's, it's, well, I shouldn't say it's confusing, because you might not find it confusing. It's just a lot of information. All right, and then... Um, Again, from, from the back, you can see that here's the supraspinatus attachment. The infraspinatus would be behind that. The teres minor would be even further behind that. Here's the subscap on the lesser tuberosity and the bicipital tendon groove right here between the greater uh, tuberosity and the lesser tuberosity or tubercle. Looking at it a little from the back, again, here's the supraspinatus in the superior for set. Here's the greater tuberosity. This is all on the greater tuberosity, or the greater tubercle. Supraspinatus on the superior facet, infraspinatus on the middle facet, teres minor on the inferior facet. Cannot see the subscapularis or the bicep, bicipital tendon because you're looking at the shoulder from posterior aspect. <coughs> I like this drawing, even though it's really old, um, yeah, sometimes these oldies are goodies. Greater tubercle, bicipital tendon, groove, and then the lesser tubercle. Greater tuberosity, lesser tuberosity, biceps tendon, infraspinatus. Greater tuberosity, biceps tendon, Long head of the biceps tendon in the bicipital groove. Lesser tuberosity.
lesser tuberosity, biceps tendon, this would be the groove, greater tuberosity, superior facet for the supraspinatus, middle facet for the infraspinatus, inferior facet for the teres minor. Hooey, that's a lot. And last, which muscle does not, does not insert onto the humerus? Supraspinatus and the infraspinatus. We know that those muscles are part of the shoulder girdle muscles, the sits muscles. S-I-T-S, supraspinatus, infraspinatus, subscapularis, teres minor and major. Sits. Oh, supraspinatus, infraspinatus, teres minor and major, and subscapularis, S-I-T-S. Latissimus dorsi also attaches, also attaches to the humerus. Very, very, very important, very important muscle, which I am not locating just yet. Come on, come on, Kim. Mm, latissimus dorsi muscle attaches right here. Yeah, latissimus dorsi is attaching right there, and this is the anterior view of the scapula and the humerus. So it's not the lat, because that inserts onto the humerus. Not the infraspinatus, because that inserts onto the humerus at the middle facet of the greater tubercle. Not the supraspinatus, because that inserts onto the humerus at the superior facet of the greater tubercle. But the levator scapula, which attaches from the superior angle of the scapula up into the cervical vertebrae. Okay, I hope you found this helpful. Um, I know it's a lot of information, and I know that I took my time getting through it, but I hope it helps you. I'll see you guys soon.